Okay, welcome back. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about uh, sections 3.3 .3 and 3.4. So uh, the reason why I'm putting these two sections together is because they're pretty, the topics in each section are pretty, uh, they're pretty much related to each other. And it's better just to, um, you know, kind of connect the topics. Um, that way they don't seem so disjoint. Um, Okay, so first thing is I'm going to define the what's called the dominant term of a polynomial. Okay. And then uh, we'll talk about the properties of the, of the dominant term. Okay. And then we'll look at uh, how to, or given a polynomial, uh, we're going to look at or learn how to determine the end behavior of a polynomial. And that involves looking at what's called the dominant term. Okay, so the dominant term actually plays a, a very important role. You know? And, and you, with that dominant term, you can see basically uh, you can get a lot of information about the behavior of the graph. Okay, um, and we'll also look at the real zeros of a polynomial. Okay, and then we'll look at the uh, at the theorem, intermediate value theorem. And we'll see how it applies to um, finding the zeros okay, or roots. So, uh, so it doesn't actually it, it doesn't actually look for it. it doesn't, it's not an algorithm to find the zeros, but it's it's a way to determine some conditions given on a certain given an interval. Um, it can tell you whether a root exists there or not. Okay, so very important idea in math. Okay, and then we'll talk about turning points. And then we'll look at the uh, shape of a graph near a zero of multiplicity. Again, zero means the root. Okay, so we'll be we'll be talking about roots here. Okay. All right, so let's get started here. Okay, so here up here you see we have a polynomial. Okay, so again, remember that a polynomial um, is basically in this form. You have the powers here must be non-negative integers. Okay. And the coefficients, a sub n, a sub n minus one, all the way down to a sub one, a sub zero. So those coefficients can be any real number, okay? So we talked about that in the, in the previous uh, video, okay? All right, so the, so what you see here, okay, uh, this, this term right here is what's called the dominant term. And I must say, it's assuming, right? Assuming that this is written in descending order, meaning that the, the, the powers are going from largest to smallest, okay? So the dominant term contains basically the, the highest exponent um, in that polynomial, okay? All right, so um, I can give you an example here. Let's say we have uh, 4x to the power 3 plus 2x squared minus x plus 5. Okay. So this, this would be the dominant term. 4x cubed. Okay. Okay. So that's our dominant term here. Okay. Uh, we have a right, we have polynomial to the sitting order, and so this is the dominant term. Okay. Uh, and we also know, based on the previous lecture video, uh, we know that this is degree three polynomial, okay? All right. So let's look at uh, some of the properties of, of, the, of the dominant term. Okay. All right, so for that, okay, we're going to consider this. We have... Okay, so not so not considering the coefficient, so only considering well, only considering the coefficient of one here. Okay, so um, so with just looking at x to the n, um, there are some important properties here. Okay, so first case because n remember n has to be a non-negative integer. Okay, so it's either got to be even or odd. Okay, so let's first assume that n is even.
even an even an, an even even number, which means that it's divisible by two. Okay, for example, uh, zero, two, four, six, and so on. Okay. All right. So um, if we look at this, okay, and I'm gonna I'll show you. So if we look at this situation, okay. Um, you have, for example, it could be x squared, right? um, x to the power of 4, x to the power of 6, and x to the power of 8. Uh, by the way, uh, 0, x to the 0, we're not, that's kind of a special case. x to the 0 is basically 1. So it's a horizontal line. Okay? So we're really considering um, integers here, um, even integers that start from 2, okay, so basically from two, okay? So you have two, four, six, and so on. All right. All right, so let me show you, I'll show you some of these, what, to give you an idea of what's happening. Okay, so if you look here, so I plotted a few, a few polynomials of varying even degrees here. So we have x squared, okay? What I'll do is I'll turn these off so you can see what's happening. So there is x squared, okay? x to the 6 looks like that, okay? x to the 8, x to the 10th, and x to the 12th. So as you, so as you may notice, okay, each curve, okay, each of these curves is crossing through these two, these two, these three points basically. Okay, and I'll plot those. So that's negative, yeah, negative one, 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 and the origin, which is at zero, zero. So every polynomial, okay, um, every I should say every polynomial of the form x to the n, where n is even except when n is zero, okay, does this. Right, so and so they always goes through, it always goes to negative one, one, one comma one, and zero comma zero. So meaning through the origin, okay. The other thing you notice is that as you increase the power, okay, as you increase the even power, the curves start to bottom out. Okay, that's what you see here. So the curves start to flatten out, okay? And it may, it, if you look here, it looks like it's touching the x-axis, but it really isn't, okay? Um, it's, in fact, you can zoom in here, and you can see that there is space here, okay? Even for x to the 12. So they all go to the origin, okay? And that's the only point they touch on the x-axis, okay? So that is the uh, that is the property okay, that I want to mention there. Okay. Okay. So basically, these flatten out around the origin, okay? and they all look like. The other thing is they all have a similar shape to something like this. Okay. Right, so they flatten out around the around the uh, around the origin as n increases to infinity. Around the origin, meaning um, zero comma zero. All right, let's look at the other case. Okay, so all right, so this is this was assuming that n was even. So now, what if n is odd? And again, here I'm saying that right. So this is starting from two. Okay, so two, four, six, eight, and so on. So if n is odd, 
okay? Then each of those graphs, okay, again, only considering this form, okay? They're gonna look similar to x cubed, right? So, so this was for x squared, right? And then for x cubed, it's gonna look something like this. Okay, I'll show you some of these. Change this to x to the power three. I'll put to the power five, seven, nine, and 11. And so you notice now, okay, all these, all the, all these plots, all these graphs go through, they go through one, one, zero, zero, and the other point is going to be negative one, negative one is down here. So again, I'll turn these off so you can see what's happening in real time here. X cubed, right? Looks something like this. Okay. By the way, X cubed is a it's increasing for all X. You have X to the five power, X to the seventh, X to the ninth, X to the eleventh. So again, what we observe here is that the graphs tend to flatten out around the origin, and it, also it, it looks like that this is touching the X axis, but it really isn't. Right. If, you, if you zoom here, you'll see that there's a space uh, between the graphs and the x-axis. That's when it's at the origin. So that is the that is the important feature here. So even if you make this as large as possible, let's say x to the power, okay, let's say 111. See that looks kind of like you no know, has kind of like a you know, like a ninety degree angle here, but it's actually a smooth curve. And again, if you zoom in here, if you zoom in far enough, you'll see that there's actually space okay between the x-axis and the graph itself. Again, all these graphs, assuming that n is odd, okay, starting from three, goes to negative one, negative one, zero, zero, and one, one. And they tend to bottom out or flatten out around zero. Okay, pretty much same effect um, with the even with the even case, except the shape is obviously different here. Okay, all right, and also for the points. Okay, let me write that here. So everything that's anything that's even, right? They're going to the points. Okay, obviously it's the origin. Okay, right. Notice the origin. Um, negative one one. Okay, and one comma one. For the R case, okay, all the graphs are going to go through, obviously, the origin, uh, minus 1, negative 1, and 1, 1. Okay. So, so there's the properties of that uh, of this, which is part of the dominant term. Okay, So we're, we're not considering, we're just considering a 1 for the coefficient. So if you throw in, if you throw in a coefficient, 
um, the effect is still the same. Okay. All right. The other, so, okay, so the other, the other item that's related to this is the, um, is the in behavior of the, of a graph okay, of a polynomial. So what do I mean by that? Well, given, given this, we can tell what the long behavior is going to, of that graph is going to do. Okay. Meaning that what's going to happen to the Y values as X approaches infinity or as X approaches to negative infinity. Okay. So let's go through that. Let's say in behavior here. All right, so considering, so basically looking at this term, okay. Okay, so again, we have to, in this case, right, we're gonna consider, okay, if N is even, right, or N is odd. So let's first assume that N is even. Okay, so if n is even, okay, and okay, we also have to, well, we also have to consider something else, right? Because this term, this coefficient could be positive or negative. So let's assume for now that a sub n is positive. Okay, right. okay so we're assuming that this term is positive, okay, and we're going to assume that n is even, okay? So basically the rule is this, okay? If that's the, if this is the case, all right? If we're assuming that this is positive and n is even, then as, as x approaches infinity, okay, the y values, which I mean, so I'm gonna call this p of x here, okay? So the value, okay, and and it really it's you know, it doesn't matter. So the other terms won't won't affect this. Okay, and I'm going to illustrate that with an with an example later. Okay, so as x goes to infinity, the y values, right, your your p of x values, are going to go to infinity. Okay, right? and as x goes to negative infinity, okay, well, the y values also go to infinity. And if you think about this case, right? If you think about the simple case like x squared, which is one of your basis parent functions, uh, that makes sense, okay? So, right? So as x goes to infinity, okay? Right? First of all, it's even, right? And there's a there's a uh, we're assuming there's a positive number there. So as x goes to infinity, these y values get larger. As x goes to negative infinity, these y values are getting larger and larger. Okay. All right. So that is the uh, that's the Case for even. If n is odd now, okay, then I'm gonna do something like this, okay, in terms of the in behavior. So as x goes to infinity, okay, the y values also go to infinity, okay. As x goes to minus infinity, though. The y values go to negative infinity. Okay, so as x goes to infinity here, right, the y values go to minus infinity. Okay. All right. So one thing to keep in mind is that this remember this is focused on in behavior. Okay. 
meaning that you're looking, what is the graph doing, right? But I should say, what is what are the y values doing as x goes to plus or minus infinity, okay? So it doesn't really tell you what's happening around the origin, okay? So sometimes you can just think of it, just remember it this way, right? So this and this, okay? So it doesn't, doesn't tell you really what's going on in between, but it does tell you what's happening as x goes to plus or minus infinity. Likewise, okay, we have something here. Okay. So it doesn't tell you, again, doesn't tell you what's happening around the origin, okay? It just tells you in, in the, what's happening in the long run, okay? All right, so this is for, I'll put that up here. This is the case for positive. Okay, so when this coefficient is positive. Okay. So the other, um, so the other case, right? The other case that we have to look at is, is that this could be negative now, okay? Less than zero. Okay, so again, we have to break it up, right, into whether n is even or not. Here, sorry, n is even or odd. All right, so let's assume that n is even now. Okay, so if n is even, all right, and we took, and we're putting a negative, right? It's a negative coefficient now. So combine this with the idea, with the, with the concept of, of transformations, okay? If we're putting a negative, so going back to this simple example here, if you're putting a negative in front of there, then what does that do to this graph? Well, if you remember, it's going to reflect it, right, over the x-axis. Remember, negatives, of, right, you put a negative there, affects the y values, okay? So you reflect, so it's going to do a reflection. So that means it's going to turn this upside down. So that tells us that as x goes to either plus or minus infinity, the y values are going to go to minus infinity. So, so it does the opposite, right? Just take the negative of these, okay? And that's because, again, you're, we're switching the sign here, right? So it's positive to negative. So that becomes the other way, okay? So it flips, so basically flips it around. Okay. Um, likewise, the same, the same idea, okay? If n is odd. So if n is odd, okay, something like this, okay, then think of this as if you put a negative there, like for example, minus one, it's going to be a reflection. So that means, okay, as x goes to infinity, p of x is going to go to minus infinity. Okay, so this one is going to go the other way, okay. And as x goes to minus infinity, p of x is going to go to positive infinity. So this part right here, okay, as x goes to negative infinity, this is going to go in the opposite direction. So it's going to go up. Okay, that's what we have there. Right. Okay, so those are the rules. Okay, so this is right. When they have a positive sign and when n is even, okay, as x goes to plus or minus infinity, the graph will go to right, the y values or approach infinity. If n is odd, okay, and again, right, we're assuming that this is positive integer, then as x goes to positive infinity, the y values go to infinity, as x goes to negative infinity, the y values go to negative infinity. When you have a negative, okay, negative value, 
And assuming that n is even, then as x goes to positive infinity, the y values go to negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, the y values go to negative infinity. So well, basically the opposites of these. Okay. And if n is odd, If n is odd, then as x goes to infinity, p of x is going to go to minus infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, p of x is going to go to positive. So taking the opposite of these values. Okay. All right, let's, uh, so let me sh let's show you an example of this. All right, so let's say we're given, we're given this polynomial. Minus 2x to the fourth plus 5x cubed plus 4x minus 7. And we want to determine, okay, we want to figure out what is P of x approaching as x goes to plus or minus infinity. Okay, so Right, we want to know, okay, as x goes to infinity, okay, uh, what is this value approaching? And as x goes to minus infinity, what is the p of x approaching? This part, what are the y values approaching? Okay. All right, so we go here to our leading term, okay, sometimes leading term, because we can, so sometimes, this is referred to as a leading term because we're, this is uh, in descending order, okay? So this is our dominant term. All right, so because it's negative, okay? You have a negative value here and it's even, okay? So negative value, right? And it's even, okay? So that means P of X, okay, is going to go to minus infinity. And the same thing as right, as x goes to infinity, right? This is going to go to negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, this is also the y values are also going to go to minus infinity. Okay. So let me show let's, let me show you that. So I got to type in the polynomial here. And that is minus seven. Okay. All right, so there is our polynomial. Okay. So, so you can see as x goes to positive infinity, the y values go to negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, the y values get or approach negative infinity. Okay. And something else, so something to keep in mind again is that it doesn't matter, right? If I can change, I can put whatever here, as long as it's not bigger than the degree, than degree four, um, this this will always be. Um, the end behavior won't change, but the graph will obviously change, right? So, so for example, if I put in like four x to the let's say let's say I remove the four there and I put x squared, right? Let's say I take out minus seven. So the graph obviously changes, but the end behavior doesn't, right? So as x goes to positive infinity, the y values still go to negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, the 
the y value still go to negative infinity. Even if I can even add on, even make this like 100, for example, like minus a 5x squared. So that means, yep, yeah, so there's, so it's going to go up. So based on what I'm seeing here, it's going up and then it's going to come back down, right? So it's, so again, the, the end behavior is still, uh, is still the same, but the graph obviously changes. All right. Okay, here's another example. All right, so given, okay, let's say our polynomial is this. And we, again, we want to determine, determine the end behavior. Determine the end behavior of this of, of the graph of this polynomial. Okay, so if you look carefully here, okay, again, so something to be very careful of is that polynomials don't always have to be expressed in descending order. Okay, so this right here, okay, this is this would not be the dominant term. Okay, so if you notice, there's a degree five there. Okay, so let's go ahead and put it in descending order. Okay. We have 3x to the fifth minus 5x cubed plus 2x. Okay, so be really careful of that. Okay, just because they give you the polynomial like this doesn't mean that this is going to be degree three, actually. Okay, it's the remember the degree is the largest exponent. Okay, so it turns out that this is degree five. Okay, all right, so with that in mind. And this is a positive, right? This is a positive term, and this is odd, okay? okay? So as x goes to infinity, y values, okay? Right, because, okay, so we have positive, right? And it's an odd. So that means the y values are gonna to go to positive infinity, okay? As x goes to minus infinity, then it's going to go to negative infinity. Okay. All right. So I put those different color. All right. So something to keep it, something to you know, something to keep in mind here. Again, this is going to be similar to minus x squared, right? Okay, it's or you can say minus x to the fourth. Okay, so so it's going to both of those y values are going to go to minus infinity. Here, this is going to be similar to minus x cubed. Okay, right. And so oh, I think this should go to oh sorry, I just noticed this was positive, right? So oh, we're great. This is positive. So yeah, so this is similar to x cubed, which is similar to x to the fifth. So yeah, so these are going to go to positive infinity as x goes to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, then these are going to go to negative infinity, just like with x cubed. Okay. So let me show you the plot of this one. And that's the nice thing about this is that you don't we don't even we don't have to look at the graph to determine this information. I just want to show you, uh, it's just nice to see the result. Kind 
of get a confirmation here. All right, so there it is. And you can do, see, again, it doesn't tell you what's happening in between the graph. It only tells you uh, what's the long-term behavior, okay? So as X goes to infinity, right? You can see the Y values are getting bigger and bigger. As X goes to negative infinity, the Y values are going to minus infinity. And again, it doesn't matter, right? I put a square here, a power term, a power two here. Okay, still, the effect is the same as you can see, but obviously the graph will change. And while this is here, just let me show you, if we put, if we make that negative, then the opposite happens, right? So now as X goes to negative infinity, right? The Y values go to infinity. As X goes to positive infinity, the Y values go to negative infinity. Okay. Okay. All right, so yeah, those are, um, that is the way we can determine the end behavior of a given polynomial, or the, the determine the end behavior of a graph of a, um, of a polynomial function. All right, so the next item on the agenda is going to be uh, the real zeros, okay? So real zeros, um, remember zeros, sometimes those are referred to as roots, okay? So we're going to define that now. Okay. All right, so this next statement is basically um, sort of a set of logical statements. Okay, so if, so if one statement is true, then the other statements are also true, okay? Um, so these are, these are basically what we call a logical, uh, basically a logical uh, statement, okay, logical circle, if you will, okay. All right, so we're gonna let, okay, we're gonna let P, or we should say, if P is a polynomial, we're gonna denote P as a polynomial and And I want to might as well introduce this. Okay, this just uh, says that C is an element of this set of real numbers. Okay, so this R. Sometimes you see it bold face in, in math books. Sometimes it's in italics. Okay, so it just means that C, whatever. So C, whatever that is. Okay, um, it's going to. It's basically. Um, it's in a collection of real numbers. That's what this statement means. Okay, so C is just a real number. All right, then, okay, the first, the first thing we're gonna assume is that C is a zero of P. Okay, so assuming this, okay, so the next three statements are going to be true. So since C is a zero of P, okay, that means we have, x equals c 
is a solution of p of x equals to zero. Okay. So remember, zero just means root. Okay. So okay. and so if we say right, so what we're so what this is saying is that if we're if we're calling this value a zero. Okay. of a polynomial, then we say that x equals to whatever this number is, is a solution, okay? So for example, okay. we know that, or let's say we have, uh, let's see. Let's say we have x squared minus four equal to zero. So. We know we can solve this by factoring, right? So this is just going to be x minus two times x plus two equals zero, okay? So, so basically, right? So if you want to solve this, right? Then we get, in this case, we get x equals two. And in the other case, we get x equals to negative two, okay? So you set each factor equals to zero. So that's what this is saying, all right? So we're saying that, okay, both of these must be, both of these are zeros of this polynomial. So when you plug this back into here, you get a zero, okay? At the same time, we say that X equals two is a solution of this polynomial. Same thing here, X equals minus two is a solution of this, okay? So that's, that's how these two are connected, okay? All right, the third, okay, third statement is that uh, X minus C is a factor of p of x. Of that polynomial. Okay, well, that's kind of what, that's what, well, that is what we have here, right? So we said this is a zero, right? Both of these are zeros of p, but these are coming from the factors, okay? So, if, so again, so these are all, so basically one, two, and three are very similar, right? They're just, the kind of same idea, but staying it in different ways, okay? Depending on the form. So we have C is a zero of P, okay? Uh, we have X equals C is a solution, okay? Sorry. okay? And then X minus C is a factor okay, of, P, you know, of the polynomial, okay? Which is what we have here. All right, the fourth thing, Fourth thing is, okay, uh, we can say that because because of these, uh, oh, any of these basically states that C is a or is an x-intercept. Is an x-intercept of the graph of P. Okay, so that's what so that's what these are, right? Um, if you write them in the proper way, okay, those are x-intercepts: two comma zero and minus two comma zero. Okay. All right, so we have there's four right four terms here, right? Zero, right? So zero of a p is the solution. Factor and x-intercept. These are all connected. In fact, we can write this um, in a in a log. We can write this basically in a logical circle. Okay. We have solution. Zero. Factor. X intercept. And connect these all. Okay. So we can, so if you're talking about zero, right? Zero is connected to the X intercept. 
Next intercept, you can connect to the solution, and then solution can be connected to the factor. So they're all related to each other. Okay, this is what we mean by logical. They're all logically equivalent. So if if one of these is true, then they're all they're all true. If one of these is false, they're all false. Okay, um, you see this kind of idea, or you see this kind of logical statements a lot throughout math, um, especially in um, linear algebra. Okay, uh, if you if, for those who plan on taking it, okay, and you'll be seeing that this kind of idea. Okay, in terms of the terms of the logic of, of other statements. Okay. All right. All right, okay, where do we go from here now? All right, so let's actually, let's do an example of this. All right. Um, in this example, let's. Uh, I'm going to give so give a polynomial, and then we're going to uh, find the zeros for that. And sort of uh, basically point out uh, in that example, point out some or use some of the terms in here. Okay. So let's say we want to, or let's say we're going to let p of x be equal to x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x. And we want to find the zeros. Okay. By the way, again, zero, sometimes zero is called root. Sometimes we call that root, okay? So the problem may state, right? Given a polynomial, it may say find the, find the roots, okay? Or zeros, okay? So same, same process, okay? All right, so here's our polynomial, right? Okay. So thinking back, right? What is the first thing you have to do? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to say, would be to factor out uh, the common term, okay, or the common variable or a common number. In this case, we can factor out an x. Okay. We're gonna have right, each of these you can take out x. So that leaves us with x squared because x times x squared, remember that you add the exponent, okay? So that's gonna be x cubed, okay? And that's going to leave us with an x here, and then just with three, um, a minus three. Okay. And so remember that we want to find the zero. So, okay. Okay. Meaning that those are the zeros, the roots, right? And those are basically we're looking for the x-intercepts. Okay. So, right, you're finding the x that makes this output zero. Okay. All right. So now here's our right. So here's our factors. Okay, we have this one, and can further break that one down. Okay, we need two x's here. X times x will give us x squared. And then we think about, okay, what two factors of negative three, such that when you sum them, gives you negative two, okay? Okay, so what two factors of negative three okay, will give us when you add them, when you take the sum of those, will give you will give us negative two. Well, if we do, okay, if we try negative one, we know negative one and three works. However, we say three minus one, okay, that's going to give us a positive two. So that's not going to work. So we just need to change the sign here. So one times negative three is negative three. At the same time, one minus three is negative two. So those are our two factors, okay? So minus three and one. And it doesn't matter, doesn't matter the order here, okay? So now, right, so those, right? So each one of these, right, is a factor of this polynomial. 
Okay, and to solve it, right? If you if you remember, okay, you basically set each factor equal to zero. Obviously, that's going to give us x equals zero. Okay. Okay, and so here, okay, that's one of our roots. Okay, the other one is x equals to negative one, and the other one is x equals to three. Okay. So you basically what you're doing is you factor you factor if possible not every polynomial can be factored in in this sense well later on we'll talk about the we're going to throw in the complex numbers so that well, basically that rule will change where we can it turns out that we can factor at any polynomial okay but just sticking to the real numbers okay like in this case okay so you can right so we have a polynomial you brace break it down right factor it set each factor equal to zero, okay? So that's, right, so each one of these is a zero or root, if you will, okay? And we can also say that these are solutions, okay? So these are solutions of this polynomial, okay? Um, and we can also say that these are factors, right? Okay, x, x plus one, x minus three is a factor of this polynomial. And these basically provide you with the x-intercepts, okay? Zero, negative one zero, and three comma zero. Okay, that is the so that's the proper way to write the x-intercepts. And remember, the x-intercepts is where the graph will cross the or touch, and we'll get to that later. The x-axis. Okay. So in fact, I'll show you this. Okay. x cubed minus 2x squared. That is, okay, so we, right, we had roots at, at negative 1, 0. At the origin, 0, 0. And three comma two. All right, so there's there's our roots. Okay, that's what this uh, that's what this polynomial looks like. By the way, right, this is if you notice this is odd degree, okay, and there's a positive sign. So as x goes to positive infinity, the y values go to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, the y values go to negative infinity. All right, let's, since we're dealing with roots, uh, let's talk about the intermediate value theorem by two roots. All right, so let me, I'll go ahead and state the theorem, um, and this is going to be applied just for, um, just for polynomials, okay, even though we can't apply this to any, to any function, okay, uh, but since that's our focus, it's just going to be for polynomials. So I'll state the theorem, and then I'll explain it. Sometimes we call this IVT, okay? Intermediate value theorem. And we're 
just focusing on, we can generalize this theorem, but we're going to, we're going to basically focus this, uh, we're going to focus on the roots since that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so again, we're assuming that if P is a polynomial, He is a polynomial function. Find on. So this is what's called a closed interval, okay? So meaning that the endpoints are included. All right, so if P is a polynomial function defined on a closed interval and P of A, we take, if we take the, the function, right, and plug in and evaluate A and B, and if the sign is less than zero, basically that tells us that, right, if it's negative, that means these have opposite signs. So minus plus will be negative, plus minus will be negative, right? So. So this will tell us, right? So basically this is telling us that these have opposite signs. Okay. Important part. Then, okay. Okay, there exists at least at least one value, which I'm calling C here. Okay. One value in this interval, okay, for which C sub C equals zero. So C is basically the, the root or the zero. All right, so let me, so, explain what's going on here. All right, so let's say our polynomial does something like this. Okay, let me draw one. Okay, and let's assume that we have, remember we're looking on a particular interval, the A is here and B is here, All right? So that would mean, right, if I take, since we need to know the sign of P of A, we plug, right? So we plug, if we evaluate this point, okay, at P, right, if we plug in, right, so if we take um, a and put into P, because that's below the x-axis, this should be less than zero. Likewise, okay, here. If I put in, if I plug P, B into P, okay, then this is going to give us, this value will be positive because it's, it's a y value above the x-axis, okay? So, Okay, input, that's the output. Input, that's the corresponding output. Okay. So, and we're assuming P is a polynomial here. So what this theorem is saying, okay, is if we start down here, okay, and we go up here, okay, that means it has to cross somewhere between A and B. Because we know, right, one of the nice things about polynomial uh, functions Okay, is that it's a uh, it's continuous. 
which means that you can draw the graph without lifting up your pen or pencil from the paper. Okay, so we can go from starting from here. Think of this as your starting point and your end point here. Um, okay, so you're starting here and you end up here. Well, the only way you could get from here to here is to cut through this, is to cut the x-axis through here somewhere. And we can't go, we can't go around, okay, because then if we try to do it that way, if we try to do this kind of nonsense, okay, then that violates the definite, that violates, it's not no longer a polynomial because polynomials are functions, right? So it doesn't pass the vertical line test. See that? So we can't go around, right? We can't go this way or this way. So, okay, so it has to be, that's why that's important, okay? We're assuming P is a polynomial. So we don't have this kind of nonsense, okay? All right, so. So the only way, right, the only way to get from here to here is to actually go through, is to go through on this, to cut through the x-axis between A and B. Now, what this doesn't say is that it doesn't tell you how to find that root, and it also doesn't tell you how many roots. Okay, notice, okay, notice in this theorem, it says there exists. There exists at least one. At least one Z, one, one value Z, right? So it doesn't tell us how many, right? It doesn't tell us how many roots. It just tells us there's at least one, right? Because our function, right? Maybe our function does something like this. Okay, that's another possibility, right? Okay, or in this case, it would have three roots, okay? But at least it tells us, right? Again, starting here, ending up here, it has to cross the x-axis at least one point. Um, does it always have to start down here? No, we could... You could flip this around, okay? Something like this, right? Say, okay. I'd say a graph does this, and again, Let's say we have to be given our interval. We have this time P of A is up here. It's bigger than zero. And down here we have P of B. It's less than zero. So either way, if it's starting up here, right? If we're starting here, okay, right? And then working our way down here, it has to cross somewhere on the, it has to cross the x-axis somewhere between A and B. So that's what I, that's the, that's what I mean. That's what I'm, that's what this means here. Okay. There has to be a, there's a, there's a sign change. So you have positive, negative. When you multiply those, you get you get a negative value. And here, right, same thing. Positive, negative. Okay. Right. Okay. So there's a sign change, and it and again, it doesn't tell you what that function looks like. Okay. Again, the function maybe does something like this. Something like that. Okay. All right. So it doesn't it doesn't tell us what the function looks like. Okay, it just tells us okay, there's at least one, uh, one, one zero. So why is this why is this important? Uh, why not just okay, we have a polynomial. Why not just set it equal to zero and solve it? Well, the thing is sometimes solving solving for the uh, solving the roots could be a difficult thing depending on the function. Um, you know, there's there's certain algorithms out there that will. Uh, that will solve, that will basically find the roots. And some of those algorithms may take like one or two weeks to run on a computer. Again, depending on the complexity of the problem and also depending on how many, depending on which root we're trying to find. Because as you know, some polynomials can have more than one root, like in this case here, okay? So a good analogy of this, like I always, uh, I always bring up this, uh, for this for this this topic is that think about this. Um, think of, so think about you're looking for, like you're you're looking for oil, 
Okay, so you, right? So let's assume that you bring out the equipment, okay? And you start drilling, okay? Um, and so there, and you start drilling, right? And, and you realize there's nothing there. So, you know, you brought out the equipment, that's, and then you put a lot of time, right? You put a lot of time and effort and resources to, to drill, basically drill for nothing. So there's actually a way to survey the ground, okay? You can bring out some, you know, some, um, you can do some test, <coughs> excuse me, you can do some tests, right? And you can survey the ground. And then if that test, if basically, if that, if there's, if that test says, okay, there's some, uh, there's a, there's some oil there, then we can, okay, we can set up the equipment and start drilling. And then we can get the oil. Okay. So same kind of idea here. Okay. So if so think of this as a condition, right? These are conditions. If the conditions are right, if, if the conditions are met, then we can start to find that zero. Okay. And like I said, finding zeros is not always a um, easy, it's always it's not always an easy um, thing to do. Okay. Especially if there's like you're looking for one just one zero instead of instead of all the zeros. All right. So, by the way, this is uh, this kind of theorem is what's called an existence theorem in math. Um, many of the theorems of math are, are are similar to this. Okay, given the situations, there exists something. Right. In this case, there exists a root or a zero. Okay. All right. So let's go through. Uh, let's go through a problem. Let's say, okay, for example, use the intermediate value theorem uh, to explain. To explain why this function. x squared minus 4x plus 3 as a 0 on this interval. So remember, they're always, they have to obviously give you the function and you have to be given the interval. Okay? All right, and so let's explain this, and then we can, and then we can um, solve for that zero. So we can solve for the zero on that interval. Okay, so. Because we're applying this theorem, okay, we need to um, we need to uh, check our conditions. So this is right. This is a polynomial, right? It's a polynomial of degree two, okay. And so um, what we need to do now is just evaluate that function, okay, uh, at two and four. So let's do that. Okay, so we plug in that, we basically plug in two, okay, and then find out what the output is, okay, and basically that's going to give us negative one. Cool. Okay. Next thing is we need to plug it, we need to plug in the other value, which is four in this case. Okay. 
Okay. So we're going to get 16 minus 16 plus 3, so that's going to give us 3. And notice that we have the sign change here. Okay. Less than zero, right? Minus three is less than zero. So So it's very important to check for that sign change, okay? To make sure, um, basically, that's going to guarantee our, our root, or guarantee that we have a root, okay? So, all right, so we have, it, we have that, right? So now we state a conclusion, okay? Well, because of, right, because of this, okay? So we can, right, we can say that there is, right? Therefore, There is at least one root or zero. Okay, one root, okay, between two and four. Okay. So because of that sign change and because we're working with a polynomial, okay, um, we can guarantee that there's a root between two and four. So let's go ahead and find that root. Let's go ahead and solve for it. Okay. All right, let's do that here. So to solve for that, okay, uh, we're going to, right, we just need to set this equal to zero, okay. Um, this is factorable. So remember, can you look at this value here? Okay, you find two factors of three, such that when you sum them, gives us, gives us negative four. Do that up here. So negative three times negative one will give us positive three. At the same time, when we, when we sum those up, negative three minus one will give us negative four. We get x minus three here and x minus one. Okay. All right, so our solution, okay. So we basically have x equals to three or x equals to one. So you set each factor equal to zero, right? So there's only one, correct answer here okay but you know these are these are the roots okay but we're only looking for the root between two and four so the correct one is going to be x equals to three this is the correct one okay so this is right so this one we don't count all right because it's not inside that interval okay so x equals three is between two and four Okay, so only this one. That's the one that we, okay, that's the one that we're focusing on. All right. Okay, so let's see, the next topic is turning points. So basically a turning point um, is where the graph changes direction. So meaning that uh, the graph could be increasing then decreasing or decreasing then increasing. So let's define that here.
the point of the graph. Point of the graph where the graph changes from increasing, decreasing, or uh, changing from or going from decreasing to increasing. So, as an example here, give you a visual. Let's say, right, we have a graph like this. There's my function, okay, which happens to be in which we're assuming is a polynomial, okay? Okay, so, okay, notice, right? This is, uh, again, you read the graph from left to right. So here's increasing then decreasing. So there's a change in direction here at this point, okay? Then they're decreasing then it's increasing. There's another change, right? It's increasing, then decreasing. So, so in, this, in this case, because we're assuming that both of these are going to minus infinity, okay? Uh, these are what's called turning points. Okay. And with polynomials, turning points are important because, as you can see, something we talked about before, okay, um, you can see that this is a relative maximum, right? And you have a relative minimum and then another relative maximum here. Okay. So turning points is a way to is a way to locate those. Okay. All right. To locate whether to locate the um, relative minimums and relative maximums. Okay. And there's a there's a, um, a connection between the turning points and the degree of the polynomial. So let's, let's take that here. So polynomial of degree n okay, will have at most n minus one turning points. Okay, well, let me do an example of this. All right, so the key here is the most, most n minus one turning points. All right, so here's an example of this. So let's say we want to find the maximum Number of turning points uh, for these uh, for the for these for this function.
Okay, so we have the polynomial minus x cubed plus 4x to the fifth minus 3x squared plus 1. All right, so if you think about it, right, what is the degree of this polynomial? Well, it's not 3, right, because remember, it's the highest exponent, so which is here. So let's go ahead and put it in just and just in, let's go ahead and put it in um, descending order here. Again, you always have to be careful. The polynomial doesn't always have to be written in, in, in descending order, okay? All right, so this, all right, so there we can, you can see, right, that you have, we have a degree five polynomial. So that means that there's gonna be a maximum of five minus one turning points. In other words, uh, a maximum number of four turning points. because the degree is five here. Okay, degree five. So there's gonna be a maximum number of four turning points. Okay, uh, let's look at another part or another function. So let's assume that our function is this. We have minus x minus one squared times one plus two x squared. Okay, so notice the, the difference between this form and this form. Here, we're dealing with something in factored form, okay? And here, this is, right, um, it's in the it's kind of the standard polynomial form. Okay, so we don't, we don't necessarily have to expand everything out, okay? Remember, this, Basically, this depends on the degree. So we just need to look at the leading terms here. Okay, so we have that this is we have minus here. This is going to be x squared plus something. Doesn't matter. We don't care. It's going to be something smaller than two for the degrees. Okay, and then this is on the order of two x squared. Right. Let's say okay. So plus one. We can go ahead and put the plus one there. Okay, so we just need to see the leading, right? The leading terms, okay? So we have, right? So basically, this is gonna be equal to, we have minus two X to the fourth plus whatever, doesn't matter, okay? Because those terms are gonna be smaller. Smaller, I should say smaller powers, okay? Smaller exponents. So based on this, okay, based on this result here, okay, we know that there's going to be a maximum number of four minus one, so in order to three, three turning points. Maximum number of, of four, four minus one, three turning points. Okay, there we go. That's a little bit cricket there, but hopefully you get the idea. Okay. Okay. Okay, so again, you, the point of this, right? So the point of this is that sometimes, you know, you could be given something with a very large number here, and then you don't have to expand it out. Just keep in mind what the, just keep in mind, just look at, just focus on the larger, on the, on the largest powers, okay? Because that's, that's what matters for this problem, okay? Okay.
this of three. Okay. Anyway. All right. So let's see what else. So I'm gonna check right here. Okay. Um. Let's see. So we talked about turning points, and let's see. Oh. Um. Okay, let's do okay, let's do another example here where we're given some information and and some uh, information about the roots. Uh, but before we do that, I have, okay, I have to talk about multiplicity here. Let's do that. So the shape of a graph near zero of multiplicity. All right. So this is going to basically focus on the factors of a polynomial. So let's say you have a polynomial and let's say that um, you factor it. And so okay, let's look at something like this in general. So let's, just, let's suppose that we have a factor that looks like this, x minus c to some power, let's say m, okay? All right, so the rule, okay, so if, so if M is odd, okay, so if that's odd, then this is going to tell us that the graph of that polynomial is going to, it's going to penetrate or intersect the x-axis at C, okay? Okay, well, because you set this equal to zero, so you're gonna get uh, this value, okay? And so this, the other, the other, the other thing is uh, this M, this is what we call multiplicity uh, for the root, okay? So this is your, right? So this is our, this is our multiplicity. So this tells us again, so if it's odd, okay, this value is odd, then that means the graph is going to cross the x-axis. We know it's going to touch, we know it's going to, we know this is, or C, that's part of our, that's the x-intercept, right? But it's going to, specifically, it's that graph is going to cut through the x-axis, okay? So, uh, so something like this, say, And so what I mean by intersect means like something like something something that does this. Okay, so that's right. So it's going to do something right this way. Okay, okay. if M is even, okay.
then the graph is going to, it's not going to do, it's not going to do this. It's basically going to touch the x-axis and go in the opposite direction. Okay, so the graph will touch, okay? So it does that when it's even. So, okay, something like this. So it'll touch it, and then again, depending on what, depending on the terms, okay, it will either do this, okay, it'll touch and then go the opposite way. So we can do that from either side. Or something like, or it could possibly do something like this. Okay, so there's your, right, so there's a root, okay, and here's the other root. Okay. So two cases here. Okay. So again, if, if it's odd, it's going to do something like this at the root. Okay. In terms of crossing the x-axis, if it's even, it's just going to touch it. So it's either it's going to touch it and then go in the opposite direction, or something like this. Right. It goes touches here and goes in back down. Okay. Those are the two possible cases. Okay. Um, so let's look at an example of this. So let's say we have this kind of polynomial, a four times x minus three to the power two times x plus one to the power three. Okay. Four times x minus three squared, and then uh, we have x plus one cubed. Okay, so, the, so basically if you, right, this is a polynomial. If you expand everything out, then you get that general form, okay? So, right, we look at the factors, Okay, so we we can find uh, we can find the roots by setting this equal to zero. Okay, so we set this equal to zero. Um, we have a we have a coefficient there, right? By the way, coefficients don't affect the roots. Okay, so no matter what this coefficient is, it's always the roots will always be the same will be the same, uh, but, the sh but the shape of the graph will change, okay? So this is equivalent to solving this. So in other words, we can just divide everything by four. Constants don't have any effect on the, on the roots. Okay, so we set each factor equal to zero, right? So we have this factor, and then we have this one. Okay, so solving this, right, we're going to get okay, x equals to 3, okay? And so because that is coming from this factor, which has power 2, okay? So that means, right, we, we state this as x equals 3 with multiplicity of 2. Okay, so x equals three with multiplicity of two. Again, that's coming from this exponent here. Okay, 
For the other one, we have x equals to negative one. with multiplicity of three. Okay, and that's coming from this number here. Two, right, that's coming from here, right? And three is coming from this one, okay? All right? And so based on the information, uh, we can say that the graph, okay, we can say that, if we, so if we plot this, we can say, uh, because it's even, we can say that the graph is going to, it's going to touch the x-axis at three, okay? Um, but it's not going to penetrate, right? It's not, it's not going to um, cross through the x-axis at that point, okay? For the other one, since that's odd, this will, the graph will cross the x-axis, um, Right at negative one. So let so okay. Let me bring up the graph here. And type it in. So we had what um, four times x minus three, and that was squared, and then times x plus one to the power of three. So there it is. Here's the here's the, the graph. Okay. So if you look around negative one, one zero, that in case, and the other one was at three. Zero. Those are our roots. Okay. So at negative one zero, okay, we said because coming from an odd, you see how it crosses the x-axis. Okay. And then for the other root, for x equals three, it's touching it and it's going back in the opposite direction. So it's going down and coming back up. Okay, so it doesn't really, it touches the x-axis, but it doesn't, doesn't um, cross it, okay? Here, here it's crossing it, okay? All right. So very important, okay? Uh, a very important rule. And, and so why another another important thing with multiplicity is that um, let's say you're given the roots, okay, and you want to construct a polynomial from that roots. So basically you're working backwards. So if you didn't state the multiplicity, then right, how would you know what this number would be? Okay. And maybe, maybe it's two, right? Maybe it's four, okay, maybe it's three. We don't know. Okay. So stating the multiplicity will give you this will give you the specific, uh, we can tell what the specific exponent will be, okay? All right, so with that in mind, let's, uh, let's, let's do an example. Where we're actually given uh, properties of that polynomial and we want to construct, we want to figure out what is the, um, or we want to basically write the function for that. And so we want to write the function of the polynomial given that given that the graph has the following. So, okay, the degree, 
we're given that the degree is five. Uh, there's a double zero. Let's see, at x equals one. So double zero just means uh, the multiplicity is two. Okay? And there's a triple zero. x equals three again triple zero meaning that it's going to have a multiplicity of three and passes through the point to two comma fifteen okay so we have the properties of the graph, we have that information, and we want to figure out what the polynomial is, okay? All right, so first, okay, we know this is, so we're given it's degree five, okay? Um, double zero at x equals one. So that means, right, multiplicity of two. Uh, triple zero at three. Multiplicity of three, okay? And then we're given this point. All right, so, okay. We have, right, we have our function, okay? We know that we're gonna have, so there's, we need to know, right? We always have, there's always some coefficient here, A. We're gonna call it A. And then we have x minus, okay? So multiplicity of two, okay? So that's gonna be x minus one to the power two. Because remember, going back to a statement that we said earlier for roots, if, right? So if that's a zero, then that means that x minus one has to be a factor. So basically you set this equal to zero. Okay, um, likewise with this one, right? This is x minus three. Okay? So if x minus one squared, again, the two is coming from the fact that this is double zero. Double zero means multiplicity of two, okay? And then triple zero. So this is multiplicity of three. So that's the other, the other factor. So x minus three, okay? With triple zero there. Okay, all right, so, so now, right, we need to figure out what A is. So we can find A by, by, by using this, okay? By using this coordinate. Okay. Use the point two comma 15. So input here, right? Input, output, right? When X is two, Y, right? Your output value is 15. Okay, so you plug everything in. Okay, so we're going to have start on this side. So we have a two minus one squared, okay, two minus three to the power three equals to fifteen. Okay, so all I did is plug in, right? Plug in your x and y. Okay, this is x, and remember this is your that's your y value, which means, right? That's f of two. Okay. f of two, okay? Okay, so now we can easily, we have an equation, right? That we can easily solve for a. All right, so this is just gonna be, this is one here. So we have one, this is negative one cubed, okay? So basically, basically we get negative a equals to 15. So that implies that a must be minus 15. Okay, and we're done. We found our we found our a value. So therefore, function is going to look like this. So we have minus fifteen times x minus one squared times x minus three to the power three. 
And if you want to multiply it all out, then you can, but that's basically what we need. That is the function, okay? All right. Okay. And basically, I, uh, I forgot to turn off share, so let me go through that again here. Here's the example, okay? Um, write the function of the polynomial, given that the graph has the following. Okay, we have degree is five. Okay, uh, we're given that the doubles, we're given the double zero at x equals one, and we're given triple zero at x equals three. Okay, and we're also given that the graph passes through the point two comma fifteen. Okay, all right. So again, double zero means that multiplicity of two. Okay, triple zero means multiplicity of three. Okay. And so, um, okay, remember that x equals one means that this is a factor, okay, x minus one, okay, is a factor here, okay. And we have x minus three, which is our factor. Okay, so x minus three is coming from there. Okay, so now putting everything together, okay, so we have f of x equals to a, we need to, we have to have some kind of constant out here, okay? Just like with the quadratic, just like with the quadratics that we saw earlier, okay? So have a, x minus one squared coming from here, double zero, so multiplicity of two times x minus three to the power three, multiplicity of three. So how do we solve for a? Well, we use this point, okay? Input is, is two, the output is 15, remember? Remember, that's just f of two, okay, for this, uh, for our polynomial, okay? So we have our function equals to a x minus squared times x minus three cubed. Again, these are coming from the multiplicity. Multiplicity of two, which is double zero, okay? And then triple zero. Triple zero is multiplicity of three. Then we plug two and 15 into here. So 15, we have a times two minus one. So you plug in two here, plug in two. Okay, and then we end up with an equation with a in it. So a has to be minus 15. So therefore there's a result, okay? All right. So going back to this example, um, there's a very interesting way to, um, to actually give us an idea. Basically this, this idea is, or this concept will um, we can, or we can come up with a way, our way to determine, or to, or let's say, to approximate, to approximate uh, the the function, to approximate the function, this function at at the given root. Okay, so let me show you how to do that. Okay, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty interesting, actually. Uh, so I'm going to erase all this here. And so again, let's suppose that we want to approximate, um, we want to find the approximate polynomial around each root. Okay, so what we do is, okay, uh, first we have to work, we have to know the roots, okay, which we do in this case, okay, the roots being, okay, we have x equals to three, okay, and x equals to negative one. Okay. Remember that's for each of these has multiplicity. X equals three, it was multiplicity of two. And then for the other one, okay, we had X equals to negative one with multiplicity of three. Okay. So to find the approximate polynomial around, around the root, OK, 
Okay. You basically plug in, okay. So you so let's first do it for x equals three. Okay. So we plug three into basically plug three into the other terms. Okay. Right. Right. So I need a calculator here. Okay. Right. So we're going to plug three. So we're not going to evaluate the function at three. What we're doing is we're going to plug three into the other the other factor. Because if we plug three into here, that's going to give us zero, which which makes sense, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to plug three into the other. Okay. So we're going to have four. Okay. We're not going to plug into this one, and then we're going to plug three into the other factor. Okay, so what we're going to get, okay, so basically this is uh, this is going to be our function. Let's call that y, okay, so we're going to get y equals to 4 times x minus 3 squared times 4 cubed, okay. All right, so let me show you. end up getting so I'll just go and simplify this this is going to be 256 times x minus 3 to the power 2 so yeah so 4 to the power 4 is 256 and we have this one okay and let me go and show you that That's our polynomial. Okay, I'm going to plot that expression in. We have 256 times x minus 3. Or oh, sorry, x minus 3 to the power 2. And there you go. You can see, right? If I, okay, so there is the original function. Okay? If I turn this on, you can see that it's it's almost identical. Actually, remember it's just, but it's just an approximation. If I zoom in here, you see you can start to see there's a little bit of separation here. So it's just it's just an approximation, but it's a very good approximation, actually. Okay, so so this is basically just approximating that, so approximating this polynomial around, you know, for this in this region. Okay. All right, let's do the other one. The other one for, right, so the other root, so the other root was for x equals to negative one. So again, you, you, you're you not evaluating the function at, at the point, okay, because obviously you're gonna get zero. So what you do, you plug that, you plug that value into the other factor, okay? So you take, so in this case, we're gonna get four times See, so four times we get negative one minus three, okay? That's to the power two times x plus one cubed. And I'm going to call that y again. So y is going to be equal to, so this is going to be minus four squared, okay? Um, so we get, so basically we get four squared. Four, And that's negative here. Or actually, no, it's positive. We get 64 times x plus 1 cubed. Okay. All right. Uh, 
Okay, so, okay, um, so that's going to be the approximate polynomial around negative, around negative one. So let's go ahead and plot that. It's 64 times x plus 1 to the power 3. And there it is, right? So I'm going to, uh, actually, I'm going to put this in a different color so you can see the difference. Put this in green. So, okay, so there's, right, so there's the original polynomial. And turning this on, you see. There is some difference there, but it's a very good, like I said, it's, it's a very good approximation around the or around this, sorry, around the root. So why are they what's the point of this actually? Well, probably thinking, right, what's the point of this? Well, the thing is, um, if you look at if you look at this from a programming point of view, okay. If we're working with this function here, right, with the original function, and if you count how many operations there are, okay, so you have a multiplication with the four. Um, you have the power, so power two, so that's another multiplication. Okay? You're raising something to the power two, so that counts as one multiplication here. And then, right, and then you have power three, so that's what you have one, two, and then there's three here, okay. Let's see, so squared, so power three. So, so two, two is basically just one multiplication. Three is going to be two. Okay. Um, have, let's see. Yep, yeah, so this is going to be one multiplication, two, so two, and then two more here. Okay, for the power three. All right, so that says, okay, so we have one multiplication, we have one here from two, okay? And then two for three, so that's five already. And then you have the multiplication between these two terms. So that's six, three, let's see. So one, two, three, four, okay, five, six, seven. So let's double check. So you have one, so one here, and then two. And so, so power raising, so raising something to the power two, is basically just one multiplication. So for example, um, four to the power two will be four times four. So that's just one multiplication. And then to the power three, it's it's two multiplications of all. So we have two, right? Two from here, one from here, that's three, and then four, from, or four times, that's one. So one, two, so, so two, three, four, five. So five, because these two terms are getting multiplied. So it's five, and then you have minus and plus. So you count each of them as, oper as, different, as another operation count. So total of, let's see, seven here. So there's a total count of seven operations. Now, if you compare that with this one down here, there's a square here, right? And so you have 256 times, that's one. This counts as two here, and then one. So one, two, Three. So three, three, only three operation counts here compared to seven here. So if you're dealing with millions of lines of code, um, that's that's uh, that takes up time. That takes up computational time. So if you're working on a project, and let's say your numbers are, let's say you're working with numbers, let's say you're working with a pol your polynomial, you're working around this part, then why not just use this one? Okay, it's pretty close. You know, we're you're doing computing, so most likely you're we're just interested in approximations anyway. So um, this was so using this, so having three operation counts as opposed to seven here, that really significantly speeds up the computational time. And you can see you can do the same thing with the other one over here. So this is actually used in, in the industry. Um, I've used it before actually to optimize code to make it run faster. Um, so yeah, so this is. An, this is something in the area of called asymptotic analysis, uh, which is, I think if some of you are going to computer science, you're going to take a, uh, you'll take most likely a course on this. But yeah, this is uh, significant in, in terms of speeding up code, uh, which is 
uh, which is very important these days. Okay, time is money, right? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go back, stop sharing this. So yeah, very, uh, very important idea here. And for those that are going to, um, into, into the, uh, into the stem level calculus, uh, you will you will see another. You'll see this idea um, connected to um, some other things. Okay, um, all right. So, particularly with what's called um, Taylor polynomials. Okay, all right. So I think I think I'll stop here. We went through quite a bit of material. Again, I wanted to. I didn't want to break this up into two different videos because these are all. Basically, these are all connecting to the same concept. Uh, that is with the, uh, obviously with the polynomial, with the, the, with the dom dominant term and determining end behavior and then connecting and then going on to the real zeros, okay? And then connecting this um, to multiplicity and then eventually um, going back, uh, talking about turning points, okay? So, all right, so I'll stop here and I'll see you all next time, okay?